Right, okay, so we've got this first question. You get a context straight away. So we've got digital video camera. Some of this portable. Context is portability. So these, these are the things that should start jumping up here. Portable, right, okay. Uh, secondary storage device. We've got to remember what that is. So that's long-term storage. That's what secondary storage devices are. For when we turn the power off, then we could save our file, just like it is on a computer. Okay? Right, so it says, straight off there, why do we need it? So why do we need long-term storage? What are we storing long-term? Right, it's a digital video camera. So what are we going to be storing? Videos. Videos that we've shot. Okay, so yeah, we're, that's what we're going to... Videos. So we need to keep the videos that we've recorded. That's what the long-term storage is for. The only one two marks, and we've, had, we've got a mark already, probably, for just thinking about that. What are we storing? Right, we're going to store But why do we need it? <coughs> why do you need long-term storage? Go on, Craig. If you don't have secondary storage, you around yeah, what you've got to remember, when we're recording, yes, we're probably going to be saving frames of video that we capture quickly to memory. But it's then got to be processed. We will not have an infinite amount of memory. Okay? Mem RAM costs money. RAM takes up space. So you haven't got an infinite amount. You will not have enough RAM to store it. So we need to like process each frame and then save it to a file. That's what the secondary storage is for. Okay, so as we record the videos, we're like recording them to the secondary storage device. So we're recording to it. There'll only be a certain capacity. Now I'm not looking at the mark scheme, I'm just thinking about the context, that's all that, that's what we need to do. That's what we've got to try and get into a mindset of. Right, so I'm recording storage. When I turn the camera off, anything that was still in memory will go, won't it? Because memory is volatile. The RAM is volatile, so it will go. So if I haven't saved anything, so let's say, for instance, I stop recording and it says processing. You know like sometimes if you do a high resolution thing, on a phone, it'll say wait processing. Especially if you try all these like night mode uh, things. If you turn your phone off while it's doing that processing, that's going to be gone, corrupt, lost. So we always use secondary storage for when we do take the power away. You're not going to leave your camera on, are you? Because it will not last very long on the battery. It's a portable device. So. What are we storing and why? Well, that's always going to come down to the same thing. Secondary storage devices are long term storage. What is RAM for? What is RAM for? Why do we have working memory? There's only two things that are held in RAM. We talked about this. What two things do we store in the computer's main memory? Yeah, data and instructions. Correct. Excellent. So the main memory is for the current programs we're executing. So with the camera, even though it's a camera, it's, a, it's an embedded computer system, isn't it? It's got a program running that's doing the recording. So we're running that, and the data is the frames of video that we're currently processing ready to write to a file in this context. But it is about context. Everything's about context. Okay. Anyone got any queries about that? Always you're coming at that. Secondary storage. If you remember that secondary storage is long-term storage, then you, you can start thinking about what that means in this context. What, do I, what am I storing long-term? There were other things you could say. You could say like, okay, we use secondary storage device and then we can transfer it. But that's the secondary thing. That's, that isn't the main thing. We're not using the secondary storage device so we can transfer it. We're doing it so we can record the video in the first place. 
Okay, we used to use tapes. And then you used to like, have to try and like transfer the tapes. And then that used to be another device that you used. Or when we got a bit fancier, we used to be able to plug into computer, control it from the computer, and read it off the tape. But messy. So yeah, it makes it a bit more convenient when we start talking about electronic storage devices. Right, second part of this question. I'm trying to find my mouse. Right, we're comparing two different types of devices. You're always going to get comparison questions. There was a further question about uh, types of media, but a classic thing to ask is about the features. So the features, if we're going to do a comparison, what are we comparing them on? And we're comparing solid state and why it's a suitable for this video camera. So we said video camera is portable. All right, so this device is going to be moved around. What's the nice thing about solid state devices? Comes from the name. No moving parts. They're solid, effectively. Okay? So, one thing, when you're moving a camera, you might generate vibrations, you might knock. If it's got no moving parts, then it's going to be more durable. So you're talking about the features that are suitable. So durability. It's not enough to just say no moving parts. You say, well, okay, so it's not, not as easy to break. Not impossible to break. So you can say, like, you're no moving parts. But you need to, it's, I've underlined that on a few people's papers, the why and the how. You have to say why, it's not enough to just state things. Alright, so, why else is it suitable? What are the things that features? It's quiet. Right, a few people said that, that's quite a good answer to that. Quiet. If you think about a normal hard drive, it makes noises because it's mechanical. But with a solid state drive, there is no background noise coming off it. So, noise levels. And in this case, it would be important, wouldn't it? If we weren't recording audio, it's noise wouldn't matter, would it? But in this case, well, yeah. But it's fast. Right, you've got to be very careful when we're talking about devices and speed. Don't just say fast. You can't just say that. You have to talk about what does it need to be fast at? Well, storing, writing. So the write speeds are fast. Which is really important because we're going to be capturing quite a lot, lot of memory and we need to store it, we need to process it and store it. And we're doing it all the time, it's continuous. So the speeds actually matter. Okay, if your speeds aren't very fast, then that will reduce the quality of the video you can record. Just like when you're streaming. If you've got a really bad connection, you have to drop the quality of the video in order for it to work well-ish. Okay, if you try and like stream 4K, on a rubbish wireless connection, it doesn't work, does it? You can't get the data fast enough. So that speed doesn't matter. So in this case, it's write speed. The reading speed would matter for transfer, wouldn't it, to copy it to computer, but focus on that. What, what are the aspects? It's portable. Yeah, they're generally small, so they're portable. Small, portable, which is ideal for a handheld video camera. So we can make that smaller and then that's less bulky, etc, etc. What other features? So we've got durability, what else? Large storage capacity. Right, capacities. We can get reasonably large and it even, so you normally you have removable things, don't you? So you can use SD cards micro SD cards. They're actually quite big now. They used to be quite small. I remember when um, digital cameras used to have like 8 meg digital cards. The big fat ones that are about this big. Um, and you thought 8 meg, wow, get a lot of pics on it. Right, we can take photos, even on my phone I can take photos at more than 8 megabytes inside just one photo, let alone video. Alright, but we can actually get quite large, for very little money, they're quite cheap these days, you can easily get yourself a 64 gigabit, uh, gigabyte one for a 10, 20 quid. Ridiculous, really. All right, which is plenty of space to store quite a lot of video. 64 gigabyte. 
you know. Uh, when I sometimes when I record at uh, high definition, if I do it on 4K on my phone, um, yeah, you might after about five minutes have a gigabyte. But yeah, six four bit. I could do quite a few minutes at super high resolution. But you can get bigger cards. You can get terabyte ones now. Huge. All right, but it's we're not asking. Because a lot of people started going into comparisons with hard drives. No, just tell me why. But you've got to come off the features. So one thing that we need to have make sure we've got in our notes is whenever we're... <coughs> he says joking. Whenever we're talking about devices... I'm still choking and trying not to choke. Trying to look like I'm not choking, but it's actually making it look ridiculous. <coughs> whenever we're talking about devices, we need to know about the features. The feature set. Because that is what we talk about. Okay, we talk about the device. Because one of the things you can talk about is cost. They're really quite expensive, but actually the smaller capacities aren't. The big capacities are with SSDs. Okay, so you just don't go for loads. Right, the next question, I don't think anyone cocked it up. The, no, there was the odd one where people did random things. Um, this wasn't, this was a pretty much a sound question, I thought. Okay, you all sort of guessed it, but the key thing, there was the odd person who only got one mark for this because they didn't do that. If it says show you working on a question, show you working, you only had to do an approximation of that, or a few people, it was interesting, I, I would have gone divide, but a few people did this, they went 100 meg times 10. Yeah, fair enough. Roughly a gigabyte. So we'll get 10 bids on there. If they're asking something that is a whole number, give a whole number. Some people put 10.45 or something. They say, no, 10. It's 10 then, isn't it? You can't have 0.45 of the video. You know, can you imagine going to the Star Wars film and seeing 0.45 of it, and then they're going, yeah, that's all we had space for. So we just stopped. But they might as well have done anyway. <laughs> I've watched any of the new ones. Not after they just repeated um, the plots from the original ones. It's like, what we do? Right, anyway. But that was a good one. Everyone happy with that? Always, always you're estimating. So don't try and get the exact number. We have no calculator, so they're not going to expect an exact number. Right, moving on. Secondary stories. Define it. Long-term story. A lot of people did say on this one, See, there isn't any deep thinking about this. It's just a pure definition question, this way. It's only worth one mark. A lot of people said, not immediately accessible with the CPU. Yeah, that's true. But the first thing you should always say is that it is for long-term storage of data and programs. Long-term. Yes, it is also. You're showing how clever you are by saying, yeah, CPU can't see it. That's how we define it. But always try and start with that. I did give people marks for saying the CPU bit. But it's for long-term storage. Right, B. Interesting one. Common storage technologies. I just walked out and shot a camera, I don't care. You can hear my voice still. Three common storage technologies. They're not asking for examples of. A few people gave examples of and then ended up getting like one mark because they gave three examples of with the same storage technology. But they want the base technology. We've only got three main ways. We have got solid state. And that is all your USB sticks. People keep putting USB. Don't and USB is not anything other than a connection system. Universal serial bus. It's how we connect devices. It's how we connect lots of different things. It's how we connect little clocks that we plug in and power off our computer. USB isn't a thing on its own. That's not an answer to anything. If you say USB flash drive, then you will be correct because you'll be saying something. So that you must say things like flash drive. But our solid straight drive is the same thing. Literally, we use the name. We don't even think of a sensible name for those. Oh, solid state drive, everyone knows what that is. But anything that uses that on memory in a chip, 
permanent memory in a chip is solid state. So that is one category. What are the other two? Some people gave examples. Yes, George. Right, optical. You were one of the few people that actually just put the three things down. Uh, optical, so that is your CD, DVD, Blu-ray, which I'm not going to attempt to spell because you all laughed at me last time. I was going to put BR. <laughs> Any other? Right, hard disk drive is an example of what underlying technology? Alex? Uh, magnetics. Yeah, magnetics. So hard drives are in that category. They use magnetic storage. So that's hard disk, or what we call hard disk. But also, as Alex said, tape. You could store it on tape. Cheap, magnetic stuff's cheap. It is prone to outside uh, influences that can really destroy it. Okay, big magnets. Don't like going next to your fancy computer system if you've got some really nice speakers. Don't go to a, a concert and stand next to the, the big woofers and everything and just lean your phone against it. Probably won't do much good. Massive magnetic fields around them things. Okay. But that's it. The technology is those. They are examples of. It asked for the technologies. Okay. Bear that in mind. What is the underlying... So on your diagrams that you make, so like for you, when you go through all the different storage devices, probably quite important to either identify the underlying tech or to do a diagram and say like, well, these three technologies, what fits under those umbrellas? However you feel that your brain will access that better. We'll talk about that afterwards. And then we get this question, which... For me, this is a good example of answering the questions in the order that you want. Don't do them in the order that I've put a paper together or an examiner's put a paper together. If you'd have done this one, where a lot of people did pick up marks on this and they, they did say like, um, old capacity, you, this is what they wanted on the other question. If you'd have done this first, you'd have got to the other question and said, oh, actually, hang on. Uh, yeah, those things. Those things that I just mentioned on another question. You sometimes get that where one question feeds another. So, that's why I made you at the start sit and read the paper. I didn't do that because it was like, oh, let's waste a little bit of time. It was, get your brain thinking. Very important now that you tackle the questions in your order. But you read them all first because you'll trigger things in your head. Right, okay, next one. Right, this was a bizarre question. Right, Gareth has got his sat nav. <laughs> it's funny that, actually, satellite navigation system, sat nav. But they should have just said sat nav. I think everyone would have known what a sat nav was, wouldn't they? They, they do that sometimes. Right, his car, his system uses ram and rom. So they're, they're going right, okay, ram and rom. Our brains should be going, like, Right, okay, features. Again, features. That's what I'm going to have to think about. There is nothing wrong when you're in an exam, when you're doing that initial read of the paper, of writing stuff like that. Features, features. And writing on your paper as you're just skimming it. So, features. So, we go features, RAM, volatile. Wrong, not volatile. Okay, RAM, working programs and data. That's what's stored in it. ROM, boot program. There are standard things that we think about when we think RAM and ROM. And we go on to this, and holy moly, they're asking us about those exact things. So it says, right, the boot sequence. The boot sequence happens when you initially put the power on. It cannot be stored in RAM, can it? Because RAM's empty. So it has to be ROM. Contents when the sat-nav is turned off. Which one's that going to be? In RAM. Okay, the stuff that we've been working on is going to be in RAM. Holds copies of open maps and routes. A lot of people got this wrong. If that word wasn't there, open, scribble that out. Copies of maps, and this wasn't there, 
then yeah, that could have been stored in a ROM. We need to be able to update the ROM for new maps, but the maps could have been stored on ROM. But if we've got routes, they're things that are going to change. ROM's not very good at changing, is it? And the open, the fact that they're open, we're saying we've got them loaded into the primary memory, the, the RAM. OK? But it's all about that. Features again. It's a question about features. Loads of people got the first two right, and then like, I don't know, it all went horribly wrong, and everyone put wrong for the last one. And the majority of you did anyway. Right, this one. There were some crackingly good, crackingly good definitions for embedded system. Everybody sort of got this, and they, I, everyone listened to me <laughs> about this one, because there's lots of uh, kitchen-based things in there, which is always the easy one to talk about. Um, but the embedded system, you've got to be really tight. It's a computer system that's inside a device. All right, that's your opener. That's what it is. It's embedded. It's inside. That's what embedded means. It does. A lot of people then went on to say, unfortunately, it does one thing. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It may do multiple things. It depends what the device is. But its purpose is to control the device. It's inside a device it controls. That's it. You don't have to say anything else about an embedded system. It's just it's a custom machine. How complicated that computer is depends on the device. Like I said, for a, a nap or a watch, I just need some of that can do displays, keep count, can do a timer, so a little timer program. But it's custom for that. Something like a digital set-top box, that's got an embedded system in it. But you're talking, you're getting onto the scale of a, nearly a full-fledged computer. But it's only got software to control the digital box. You know, it's not designed to play Quake, or Counter-Strike, or Flappy Bird. <coughs> its purpose is to capture video streams, record them, play them back, let you do all those sort of things. Set up like um, reminders and recording reminders, all that sort of stuff. That's what it's designed for. So that is an example of an embedded system. Probably a complicated one because it's probably got a graphics card and all sorts of weird stuff in it. Okay, and specialist chips to do compression and what have you, and to access the um, encrypted stream and all that. So it's probably got quite complicated things, but it's still an embedded system. It's controlling the device. Okay. Yeah, stick to kitchen appliances unless they say <laughs> not including kitchen appliances. All right, then we might be in trouble, but other sensible thing. Yes, Danny. Would an electric toilet be in a system? Yeah, it would be. If you're that posh that you've got an electric toilet, then I bow. Oh. Yeah, yeah, like the yeah the Japanese uh, public toilets, where they they tell you what to do next in case you didn't know what to do next. And stuff. Yeah, well, yeah, it's sort of like a hose. Yes, Danny. Yeah, God. Pardon? Smart fridges is an embedded system again, yeah. Right, moving on. Right, this really annoyed me, this question, because we spent quite a bit of time on the CPU, and quite a few of you, it all went out the window. Right, registers, they're the storage locations. So that's your first thing. So when you're looking at this, you're going, right, the storage stuff. Storage, not actions. You've got, to, you've got to think in this way about the CPU. Registers don't do anything. They're just a box where there's a number. The purpose of the register, that's another thing. So it's not actions, it is purpose. Always with registers, it's purpose. Okay? There were some good answers on this, but there were some tragic answers and some blanks, which really upset me. Right. The first one you should remember, the start of the fetch execute cycle. Program counter. It's a number. It holds 
the address of next instruction. That's what it does. It doesn't do any action. It just holds the address of the next instruction. That's it. Nothing else. Remember, the CPU's dumb. You have got two components in that CPU. Control unit, which performs the fetch execute cycle. Okay, executing instructions when it's its job. And the arithmetic and logic unit, which does arithmetic and logic stuff. But they're components, they're not registers. They're components. Right, following the fetch execute cycle round, which is how I remember all these registers. Right, the memory address register. It doesn't do anything, it doesn't fetch anything. All right, a few people said that, it doesn't do anything. What it does is the value that it holds is the memory location that is selected, ready for access. So it specifies the memory address or location, but address is the correct word. We want to access, that's it. So that might be, if we want to read something from memory, that's the location we're going to read from. That pen's dying on me. Right, so what goes in there initially is whatever was in the program counter. Because we want to get an instruction. The program counter says, oi! I've got the address of the next instruction. So the control unit says, oh, I better put that in the memory address register so that I can set that, select that location. Then I'll be able to get the instruction. The next register in the fetch execute sequence is the memory data register. And a few people got this answer bang on. It holds temporarily which I can't spell. I put Temo. I was going to pretend I was writing a P that was hanging down a bit, but I won't. Temporary. Holds whatever's been read from memory. Why am I saying memory and not RAM? Go on. Is it because there's more than just RAM which counts as memory? Yeah. It could come from RAM, it could come from the cache, it could come from ROM. All of those are primary memory. Right, so it's whatever we're reading, but also if the CPU has a value that it wants to store in memory, it goes in the MDR first. Oh, these pens are hopeless. Try that for a while. Right, value that is to be written. So if, I, if I've done a calculation and I want to store that somewhere, yeah, I'll set the memory address register with the place I want to store it and then I'll say, oh, put that in the memory de data register. And then the control unit will go, oh, write that to memory. Right. Another register that we could have said. Accumulator. Which we write as ACC, the accumulator. Temporarily, which I, again I can't spell so I'm not going to put that. Temp storage of results. So whenever the ALU does a calculation, the accumulators are used. Most um, CPUs have got more than one accumulator, but there are some that have only got one. Um, temp storage of results from ALU. I think someone did put that one down. Okay. Any other registers that we could mention? Yeah. 
That's not a register. The ALU is not a register. It's a component. Yep. CIO. Correct instruction register. While not required, you won't get tested directly on it for GCSE. It is there. And if you put it down, you will get the marks. That holds the instruction we're processing. So the one we've just fetched from memory, that's where it's temporarily held. And I, I'm not even going to bother putting temp this time. So, right, gents, whenever you get a question about registers, your brain should be saying, right, stuff is stored. That is all. They don't do anything. They don't do any actions. They're used to hold data for something. And that's it. Okay? Any got, anyone got any queries about registers? Registers are nice. Nice and simple. The CPU is a nice and simple thing. Right, the next bit. This was answered pretty poor. Uh, and there's quite a few people that don't know the difference between a billion and a million. Okay, uh, you should come work for me, I and mean, then I can get away with paying you a thousand times less. <laughs> right, Hertz. As soon as I see Hertz, I should be thinking physics. What is Hertz? Frequencies, cycles, isn't it? Cycle. Hertz is cycles per second. So I think, oh, hang on a minute, cycles per second. Yeah, it's frequency. How often something happens. Well, that in hertz we measure it in seconds. What does the G mean? Giga. giga. We go, oh yeah, yeah, giga. How many is giga roughly? It's a billion, it's a thousand million. A thousand million. Which we call a billion. <coughs> Right, I'm not answering the question yet, I'm just picking the question apart. Okay, so clock speed. Go back to our CPU diagram, where did the clock go to? What did it go into, what part? Yeah, control unit, correct. It governs, and someone used that exact word, governs. It's a governor, that's what a clock is. It's the governor of the control unit. It says, get on with the fetch and execute cycle. Now, it gets a bit woolly here because there is no one way that that clock is used, okay? So, the example would have to be a bit loose what they accept here, but it determines the speed of the clock, uh, the fetch execute cycle. That's what it controls, because it's governing the CU. of the fetch, decode, execute, this pen's dying on me. Yeah, it controls that. The faster the clock, the quicker that the CPU can get instructions and execute them. So if you lower the clock, you will slow the CPU down. This is what uh, mobile devices and laptops do when the power gets low or the heat goes up. They throttle, they change the clock speed automatically. You'll know when your laptop's getting hot because the fans kick in. You know when your phone's getting hot because it starts burning a hole in your pocket. Right, so that's what it determines, the clock speed. But we need to make sure we say, well, what does this 3.8 gigahertz mean? Well, it's 3.8 billion times a second, which is the other thing that they were looking for. But a few people put million, which is quite disappointing because you threw a mark away. And that was a lot of people. It's like, oh my God, we don't know the basic numbers. <laughs> Basics. Right. So it determines that. You could say it's how many instructions you can execute per second, but it isn't directly related to that. It's more complicated than that. Which is what the second question is about. Yeah, go on. Should you care about the speed of a computer CPU? No. 
You've got to be, we've got to be more accurate. We've got to be on the money when we're answering the, G the GCSE questions. We'd get away with that. In year nine, we'd get away with that. We'd let you say, oh, you sort of got the right idea. But we need to be accurate. Okay? The control unit, on our little diagram that we had, see you, we had the clock going in. It's controlling how quick the control unit operates. But it's more complicated than that. If you do A level with me, we will talk about how that actually works down on the CPU properly. Okay, but for GCC it's too complicated. Right, the next question then leads into this. So it's like going, hey, clock speed, you've just been telling me about those clock speeds. Let's see what you really know about clock speeds. Right, so we got this daft question, quad core, dual core. Okay, yeah. What's the clocks? Doesn't say anything about the clocks, does it? They're just saying because there's four CPUs, it's going to be quicker. But I would my opening gambit on this would be well, this might have clock speeds that are way quicker than a quad. Once you start getting more CPUs, you have to be careful about the heat. So you might drop the clocks. You might have a, a one gigahertz clock for each of those CPUs. But with a dual core, you might go, you know what, let's go for 2.5 gigahertz. So on the gigahertz scale, okay, it's going to be better because it's got five in total. It doesn't work that way. All right, but that's just a, a quick observation you can make. What are the clocks for these two? Talk about that. But there's a bigger problem. And a few people did get this. It only going to run quicker, a quad, if your task can be split up into four distinct things that can happen at the same time. That's the importance with multi-CPUs. It's great. You could have, you know, I think in, uh, I think this has got like eight cores inside it. Okay, my fun. It's got eight cores. Right, that's great if I've got eight things that I can run simultaneously. Otherwise, the cores will be sat there doing nothing. With a lot of programs, they're linear. And people said this. They're linear. So it's like you do one task after another. So it, you can't use multiple cores. You only need one CPU. So it's dependent on the task. So it's about tasks. What are we running? If you're doing video encoding, as many CPUs as you've got. Thank you very much. Because you can split and work on one part of an image at the same time as another part. They're independent. So what are we running? Someone said like you're running multiple programs. Yeah, all right. If you're multitasking, you've got a browser open, you're doing some word processing, you're listening to some music, they could all run on a separate CPU. Couldn't they, theoretically? What are we running? So it's about parallel tasks. Because we're talking about parallel processes, multiples, tasks that can be split up and done at the same time. That's when you get the advantage of multiple cores, parallel tasks. But they want you to explain that. Okay, so the clock, clocks are like, yeah, throw away, I'll have that, I'll have a mark off that, thanks. Then it's like, okay, let's get into the meat of this. That's what we're talking about. It's about tasks. What are you doing on that computer? Okay. Right, moving on. Right, virtual memory. Oh dear. <laughs> Round of poll this stuff. Right, virtual memory. Right. Virtual memory is an extension, isn't it? That's all it is. It's just an extension. There was a couple of really good explanations of this. And when RAM is full, we use our secondary storage device. So remember our little diagram that we did? RAM. And there's nothing wrong with drawing a little diagram and explaining the diagram. Just looks like that. Our RAM, our virtual memory. It's overspilled. And some people put some really good things on it, and they said things like, 
Oh, the, the, the program and the data that we're not currently using, we can store that in the virtual memory. Yes, that's how virtual memory works. When we need them again, because we know, because we talked about it on the other question, the CPU can't see the virtual memory, can it? So we have to uh, bring that data and those programs back into RAM. But we'll have to make space. So we'll have to take something that's not being used and put it in virtual memory, so it's a swap. So we go, what we want, what we don't need yet. And it's just that swap, and that's sometimes why they're called swap drives. Okay, because you're doing this swapping. So it's, it's not like you do it once, you're doing it continually. Because the CPU can only see RAM. So it does tie in with that other thing that we were talking about. But that's what they always wanted to explain with virtual memory, the swapping. Don't say, oh yeah, because we'll run out of RAM and we can just use it as extra RAM. No, it's not extra RAM. <coughs> We you put into virtual memory the things that we currently don't need. We will want them again in a short time, but we don't need them at this exact moment, and then we bring the things back into memory that we need. So it is an extension, but it's not, it's not an extension as in the CPU can use it directly. It can't. So you have this swap process. Okay, swapping. That's what they want you to talk about, swapping. And then the last bit, a few people were just like scrubbing around on this one. And they were saying, I won't scroll it up because you can see it. Um, they were saying things like, oh yeah, 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 it's quicker, quicker, it's quicker. No, I know it is. I know it is. I know it is. I know it's quicker. I know it's quicker. Know it's quicker. Don't, don't, don't tell me it's quicker. Tell me why. There's a keyword. Why? Why? Right. Because virtual memory is slow, the more we use virtual memory, the slower overall the computer system is going to get because of this constant swapping. A few people mentioned disk thrashing. The actual term is disk threshing, but I'll let you off with thrashing. It's not like you're not eating it with a branch. Okay. Oh, I'm you, you. Oh, disk. No, you're not doing that. What you're doing. What this threshing actually means is this process, you've got so much stuff you want to do and so little RAM that you are constantly swapping things in and out. And the, the problem with that is that you spend most of your time swapping things in and out and you do, oh, run a program for a bit. No, I've got to swap something again. And you're just constantly swapping. When you've got a hard drive, you can hear this process. You know, you know you're struggling with virtual memory. The hard drive's going gig, 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 all the time, and nothing's happening on screen. Yeah, it's a good show. So, wouldn't that be a reason why she should get more RAM? Yeah. So wouldn't that be more marks? Yeah. If you explain that fully, though, you've got to. You can't just say, "Oh, it's going to." You've got to say that you spend too much time doing that. So what we can do, if we increase the amount of RAM, we reduce the amount. You can't get rid of virtual memory, okay, weirdly, no matter how much RAM you've got. There's all, the operating system just uses a bit anyway. But it's, it's like, say, right, okay, yeah, if you're doing this and we're spending all our time swapping, okay, then we're not doing what we want to do, which is running our programs and processing our data. So if we get more RAM, we reduce. We don't get rid of, we reduce. Don't start talking about it's cheaper. It's nothing to do with cost. Okay, so please don't do that. It is the number one thing. If anyone says, right, okay, I've got a computer, it's a bit old, what can I do to speed it up? First thing, put as much RAM in as you can. Second thing, replace any hard drives with solid state drives. If you can't take, because if it's a laptop, you can't do anything about processes and things, but you can usually put as much RAM as you can fit in there, and then an SSD, the fastest SSD you can find. And that will speed up this process. And it is, 
It's never going to be as fast as RAM and SSD, but an SSD is going to be better than a hard drive, because hard drives are mechanical, slow. Okay? So you could, you know, get more RAM is because you're reducing that swap load. If you want to see how bad your computer can get, take as much RAM out as you can. And, and, and load up a load of programs at the same time and see what it's like. Treacle. It'll be like. I really like the computers were. <laughs> not too long ago. Okay, right. No, you don't, you don't get them out just saying distrust and you've got to explain why. What that means. Yeah. Then you would. Right. This question drove me nuts when I was marking it. There were some people who got this question wrong. Which was like, are you kidding me? I had some people add gigabyte as the last one. But we got a petabyte there, haven't we, which is bigger. Yeah, but did you know what a megabyte was, a gigabyte? Right, it's a, if you didn't know what the PB was, you know it's not those other ones. So you could put those in order and then just stick it at the end. That's what you should have done. Yes? Do what? I didn't see that one. Yours is quite hard to mark sometimes. Because I haven't got the question there. Yeah? You marked one wrong, but I got it right. I'll check it in a minute. Let me finish going through the paper. Right. If you don't know something in a question, look at everything else. Look at everything else and see logically where the thing you don't know about might fit. You're always going to get things that you don't, oh, I can't remember that, or I don't know. You've got to use intelligent guessing. Don't just like, oh, I don't know. Right, the decimal number. I'm not going to go through the process, because we know the process, but I am going to go through some of the, a few people did that really annoyed me. What number is this? I'm going to give you a four-bit number. I want you to tell me what number it is in deanery. What is that in deanery? Um, so yeah. If you write anything that looks ambiguous, bang, no marks. You can't do that. If I if I make a mistake and I oh it should have been a one, I'm going to cross it out and I'm going to write it underneath. You must not do that. Right. The next one. This was hopeless. This was this was quite upsetting to me. So for that, that one, I put the answer in. You marked it wrong. For which one? The one we'll, one. we'll deal with that at the end. Right. So hexadecimal. Convert the hexadecimal number three e to decimal. Show you working. So they want to see some working out. Right. Three e. We could do it. We haven't got a calculator, so I don't like doing a the quick way. So what I would do is write it binary. So each hexadecimal digit is four bits. The numbers 0 to 15. Yeah? F beam 15. But it's four bits. So each one of these hex digits represents four bits. So your starting point Write down what three is, is four bits. Well, that's not hard, is it? No, no, one, one. E, that's the E, okay, E's 14. If you forget about hex, do a number line. Going 0 to 15 and go 0 to 9 and then go A, B, C, D, E, F. No one's going to think anything of you. No one's going to think you're dumb because you've had to do that. You're getting the answer right. So E is 14, which looks like this. You've got a number in binary. What number is it? Well, it's just the column headings again, isn't it, now? So 1, 2, 4, 8. And then we've got 16 and 32. I don't care what those two are because they've got zeros. So I've got 48 plus 2, that's 50. 58. 62. That's how you do it. There's no magic. No magic. 
<laughs> right, okay, and then the last set of questions. Right, adding up. Again, they'll give you working marks for these questions. There were some very dodgy answers to this. Okay, there was people that probably thought they got the right answer, and I didn't mark it, or I put an X. It's because you didn't get the right answer. If we're adding 8-bit numbers, the answer is 8 bits. Your working out might generate more bits, but your answer needs to be clear. This is what I recommend you do. Right, so we go through the work. We go not and not is not. One and one is not. And then you've got to show your carry. Wherever you put your carries, you stick to your method. I'm going to put my carries here, then I won't screw it up. So I put my carry. Then I go not one and one. Well, that's not carry one again. Now they've, they've done something here on purpose. Then we get one not and one. Oh, hang on a minute, it's not carry one. Oh, hang on, it's doing it again. Not carry one. Not carry one. Oh, not carry one. Not carry one. So you end up with that. That is not the answer. Right, my recommendation is always when you get a carry at the end, you mark it and you say carry. But I would, as a matter of course, go, you know what, the answer is no, 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 no. Answer. And I would write next to it the answer. Not leave it up here at the top of the page and hope that someone realised that a load of circles underneath that bit of writing is where the answer is. In math, do you get allowed to do that? Do you have to underline and say this is the answer? And yeah, well, same, same for this. Right, the answer is the eight bits. You cannot present nine bits and say it's the answer, it's not right. Okay, unless you indicated that that, that extra bit was separate, I didn't mark it. Okay, I might have actually given you marks for doing, showing you carries you're working out. The, the sad thing was, even though people didn't get this right, they, you all knew what the problem was. You've had this over for the number's too big. You need nine bits to store the result, because it's too big. Excellent. Practically everyone got that answer right. There was a few people, someone put stack overflow. Stack. They've been looking at too many uh, programming things. <laughs> All right, it's not Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow is something completely different. Right, and then the last bits. A shift. Right, there's a knack to doing these on paper. Right, we're shifting it to the right. So it's going to go this way. The easy thing to do is to look at your number and say, right, okay, if I'm shifting it right, what happens to those two? They go, don't they? They're, they're bye bye. So for yourself, highlight the ones you're going to keep. That's your number, isn't it? And write that down. So I've got 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. Ideally, we should have the same number of bits that we started with. What do we pack the end? with zeros. Okay, so that's your answer, you only got one mark for that. But this is the best way to do it, gents. Just identify the bits that you're keeping. So you say, if I'm shifting it three, I'm gonna lose those three, do those. And then you've got it, easy, can't screw it up. The effect, it changes the number, some people say. Yeah, yeah, it does, it, that's not the effect. Okay, the number is different. Right. Every time we go that way, we're dividing by two. So we've divided by four. That's one effect. There was two marks though, so it's like, oh, hang on, we've probably got to say something else. Well, we've lost some data. We've lost information. Dropped off. Literally has dropped off. That's what you need to say. That's all that shifting does. If you go the other way, what's the effect? Yeah, multiplication by two each time you move. So like two, four, eight, whatever. Keep doubling up. 
Right, and then this last one, truth table, A and B are our input, and we're saying A and B, and we want to know what P is. Right, I'll give you a tip here. Don't try and do it straight in. Quite a few people got this right, but there were some mistakes on this. Right, I am going to write another column on here, and I'm going to call it A and B. And I'm going to write out what A and B is first. Yes, it's going to take me some time. So I'm going to say false and false. Well, that's false. Uh, false and true. Well, that's false. True and false is false. But true and true is true. So I've written that. But I want not of that. So that's the opposite. So, oh, false is true. False is true. False becomes true. Oh, true is false. That's what you need to do. Whenever we get a logic question like that. Now, we haven't done this yet, but we did it at year nine, didn't we? The old logic stuff. Okay. But really, gents, <coughs> it is about context and it's about, okay, what are they ask really asking? Yes, I've got to recall some facts, but what are they asking? That's what we've got to do with these questions. Okay, right, I'll stop the video there and then I'll post that.